Okay, we're going to get started. The next presentation, uh, you know, Lena's such a tough act to follow, so if you know, cut me a little slack on this. You know, but, uh, anyway, this is uh, related to a study that we did uh, recently on uh, inflation. Uh, and I want to emphasize that this is assessing the risk of inflation. Uh, this is not a projection, uh, this is not a forecast in the normal sense. This was to look at the, the current trajectory of things, and assuming there's there's no no major structural changes, you know what what, what comes out of this, um, and and it's it, it's it is truly a, a notion of risk. Some of our readers are investors, for example, and they, they want to have some sense of uh, what the risk is of inflation, so that they can build that into their their uh, their portfolio somehow and how they, they position themselves. Uh, other people want to know for other reasons, so it's it's a uh, it's a first shot at this. Uh, where this comes from is that uh, in addressing this economic slowdown, the Fed engaged in a variety of programs, which I, I know you're mostly aware of. Uh, obviously, there's a broad-based expansion of reserves, and there were all these QE programs. When interest rates are already on the floor, you can't use the interest rate channel to influence uh, the economy. Uh, that is a powerful channel. Interest rate and credit channels are some of the most important uh, channels of monetary policy. Uh, I, I emphasize that because um, it, it, it points out that uh, that uh, some of the, the traditional mechanisms we might have in place aren't working effectively for various reasons, and that's one of the simplest ones to see. You can't lower interest rates when they're already zero. So they engage in quantitative easing, saying, I can't do it through the interest rate, I'll just put more money into the economy and there'll be certain reasons why that, that might be helpful. And that was the QE1 and QE2, and people talked very awkwardly about the QE3. Then there was a twist program, and this was tried in the, in the 60s and, and had nearly zero success, but they decided to do it anyway, basically because why not? It can't hurt a whole lot, it might do something, we can tell people we're trying our best, even if it's a marginal improvement, what the heck? And what it does is you, you, you sell the, you, 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 you shift your portfolio toward the longer bonds. So you're actually starting to influence the longer interest rates. That was sort of the, the, the notion of that. Now, I, I emphasize that here because what it does though is it, it, it restructures the Fed's portfolio of bonds. And that has an impact on their ability to conduct policy to unwind at what they've done in the future because they're normally working with sharp bonds. And if you were in a, in a rapidly rising interest rate environment, it, it's a different game trying to sell um, these uh, long bonds, right? So th there are some issues here structurally that, that they have to deal with. Now, we are not trying to argue that the Fed can't try to contend with these and may, may even succeed, but we're just looking at obstacles, uh, a bit of slow adjustment, make it more difficult, whatever. We're trying to get some sense of, of how this might play out. The well, just to clarify, so QE1, QE2, I mean, they were kind of expanding the Fed balance sheet. The twist was not affecting the balance sheet size. It was simply selling, was it selling short and then buying long? Yeah, yeah, they were, they were shifting out uh, maturities. And uh, that, that was because they thought they could bring down longer term rates a little bit more, even though the, the short rates are already on the floor. Right. And so it, it did not, it was not designed, I'm not, I'm not trying to hedge, but it wasn't designed to substantially uh, increase the money supply, just as you say, you know, move, move the money around a little bit, you know. Um, and the goal is simply to lower the long-term Yeah, bring down the long-term rates a little bit. That's where people live, you know, when you, right. when, you, when you borrow, you're out there to longer rates. So they were hoping that that might give some sort of marginal improvement. And it, it's fairly cheap because it doesn't involve, you know, uh, enormous total overall expansion. Right. They also had to absorb a lot of bad loans. Uh, they've got some things in their their, uh, in their balance sheet that they didn't used to have. There are issues with swap programs and foreign banks. Uh, I, I, I get each one of these actually, why they would do each one. For example, the swap programs with foreign banks. If you're trying to stabilize the U.S. economy, I mean, you've got some foreign banks that are trying to, uh, they're, getting, they're getting calls for, for U.S. dollars. Um, if those banks are having trouble meeting those demands, they're going to go into the marketplace and hopefully it'll influence you know, domestic uh, uh, money and domestic rates. 
And so to head that off, you, you go right to the foreign bank and you, you, you make a deal with them, you swap, or you go through the central bank. In some cases, they went directly to the banks. In some cases, they went to the central banks and they arranged swap agreements to bypass the market. And so there, it's more efficient. It's a more efficient way to keep control of the demand on, on your, your, uh, your market. So and there's reasons to do these things, but each one has a, a consequence. Now, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. the absorption of bad loans, are, are you just referring to the Bear Stearns deal? What, what else? What, what's all, of, all of the, uh, the mortgage-backed securities that they, they want to buy, uh, that, that didn't play the Bear Stearns. Oh, okay. So that was the total. Yeah. Sorry, what? Yeah. AAG. Oh, AIG. Made in line one, two, and three. Yeah, you know, there's a number of things that they had to absorb. So again, my my purpose is not to discuss the wisdom success of these programs, but we're looking at the aftermath. That's kind of where that's why I'm kind of pushing by that. I'm just saying they did all these things that that created uh, a need to expand money in various ways and to restructure uh, their 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 holdings. And and now faced with that, what what is the potential for inflation? What do we see from here? Now, I'm going to do a real simplistic thing to start with, and this is basic quantity theory. Um, and I, there was a time when it, I, I would be reluctant to put this on a slide, uh, but my, my last day at the Fed, I had lunch with the vice chairman, and we sat at lunch, and he said, well, what's your inflation forecast for the next whatever? And, uh, and I. I wasn't expecting this, and being an economist, I my had to do with equations and models and you know and everything. And no, 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 no. I said, so you know, we, we control the money supply. We're growing at this rate, and then we, went, well, we walked through the quantity theory. And they actually do this at Fed meetings. I mean, the reason is this has to work. This is arithmetic. It, you, you, you can't bypass this. That these numbers have to add up at least ex post, you know, after the fact. So it, it's often a nice place to start just to get some sort of a foothold. And then you start to get a little bit fancier about things. So anyway, it's it's the money supply, and that's typically something like N2 times the velocity of money is equal to the price level times uh, real GDP. Now, this is uh, this is intriguing because the Fed has been on the search to find the correct M uh, for a while. They're having trouble. They used to use M1. They moved to N2 and out toward M3, and they they're trying to find the right aggregate that connects to prices. And this has been a bit of a, of a challenge. They developed some uh, like monetary services indexes that did a little bit better. The busy indexes, which weighted components of the, the aggregates, and they, they tried to, to to find a better a better a better monetary aggregate to connect to prices because the connection isn't as good as it used to be. I mean, you start doing the analysis and using money supply to, to project inflation, and, and you have a much tougher go than you once did. There's, a, there's an old St. Louis model from the St. Louis Fed in which they used simply lags of money to, to, to uh, model the, uh, the macro economy. Uh, and it just doesn't work so well. Uh, what, what happened? There's a, there's a, the linkages are shifting. So there's a structural problem. Anyway, velocity is the, the velocity of money is the circular velocity of circular. The velocity of circulation, circular velocity of money. And what it really means is money circulates. If I buy something from you, you take the dollars, you go buy something from somebody else who takes the dollars and buys. And so the money's moving around the economy. And so the velocity of money is the average number of times that a dollar changes hands in the economy in a year. It's, just, it's a movement type of a thing. Now, if, if we do this in percentage terms, and this is the, the, the growth rate of the money supply, the growth rate of velocity, the growth rate of prices, which is inflation, and the growth rate of GDP. Now, if, and this is a huge assumption, and we'll attack in a second, but if we assume the velocity and GDP don't change, we're looking at a given GDP, GDP is going to stay in a 2% area or something like that. That's 2% growth, so that would be a 2%. But from the short run, if we assume that GDP and velocity don't change, then those two cancel out, and you have, the, you have that the, the growth rate of the money supply equals the inflation rate. So this is the old quantity theory that, that sort of says that all else equal, that the inflation rate is proportional to the money supply growth rate. But clearly, velocity and GDP make a difference. If you bring them in to complicate things, uh, then the arithmetic has to hold. Now, uh, if you look at the, the numbers, these are the most recent uh, series uh, available. 
uh, M2, these are growth rates of M2. As you can see, you're over 9% uh, or it's about 10% uh, growth rate on, on M2. And uh, GDP uh, is growing, thank heavens. Uh, but as you can tell, it's, it's just over 2%. And as we'll talk about uh, tomorrow, one of the interesting things here is this is the 10-year moving average. I'm pretty sure that's 10-year. Yeah, 10-year moving average. And in fact, we've recovered to the, the long-run moving average of, uh, of GDP. So uh, I don't know where it's going to go from there. In any case, uh, if you if you, you compare those, uh, you've got a, you've got a lot of money for a smaller amount of GDP growth. So that, that's a formula for uh, inflation. So if we do this, walk through it simply, um, M2 in, in 2011 grew at a year-to-year -year rate of about 10%. GDP during that period uh, grew at 2.8%. Now if we assume there were no changes in the financial payment system, that is no velocity changes, then this would translate to a potential inflation rate of about 7.2%. It's simply the 10 minus the 2.8. Now there are problems with that. I mean, uh, I, I would not take that one to the bank. I mean, but you know, it's it's it's, it's just the first whack. Um, it uh, it ignores velocity changes, and velocity does change. Uh, and it also ignores the overhang of bank reserves. If if the money supply is such a critical component of this arithmetic, and as I say, ex post arithmetic has to work, uh, then you would want to be thinking also about uh, what is the future growth of the money supply? And with that much, as much as we have in reserves right now, there's a lot of potential for increased money supply. Now, also keep in mind that, that this arithmetic is is in, is fixed in time, but uh, a lot of, of expansion of the money supply in the way that it affects prices is with a lag. It's a classic long and variable lag thing. So you're looking at a year and a half, two years in the future when this ultimately has its full impact on prices. Uh, the MV side has to equal the PY side, uh, but the, 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 the fact is that with expanding money supply on the short run, you often see increases in output, um, but over the longer term, it moves out of the output and over into the prices. So it's the division of the impact of money on prices and output that changes over time. Yeah? You talk about the lag of monetary policy. Um, Globally, has that lag tended to lengthen uh, in periods, that, in recoveries that um, come after financial crises? Is there anything? There are there are more problems with financial crises. Uh, this payment system isn't working correctly. It can interfere with with, with the lag process and, and lengthen it. On the other side of it, you have a lot of uh, innovations in the financial industry that are tending to, to shorten that. And there's a growing sophistication of the public. Uh, the, the, the impact of money on output depends upon the, the, public, the public being fooled, with them uh, not quite catching on to what's going on, uh, and adjustment mechanisms. Uh, for example, at one point, I was in charge of corporate revenue, gross profit, and pricing for multinational corporation. And every, every week, uh, I got massive printouts, and we had massive printouts. And, uh, and I would see, I would see the average price that we were getting for each product that we had, and we had thousands of them. You know. And uh, I could see the prices going up or down. And so I would see prices going up at once. Like this actually happened. And I thought, oh wow, the marketing program's working. <laughs> you know, we're selling more. You know, that's the idea. And so I go to the uh, to the uh, the CFO, and I say, okay. We're doing it. Let's uh, let's expand production. And take advantage of these increased margins and everything. And uh, and then you know he said, well, you better check and make sure that this isn't just a total cost structure shift and based on inflation. Well, that's interesting. So I called manufacturing, called the VP of manufacturing, negotiated new wage, no new wage contracts, did no new uh, contracts with suppliers. So the prices, the cost structure had not changed. We weren't paying more for our materials, but we were seeing increased prices for goods. That's an expansion in the profit margin, and that's a good thing. I don't care what's causing it, so we expand production. But very quickly, we started to see week after week the cost rise, the margin squeeze, and then we want to cut back. <clears throat> Basically, we were tricked. 
it was an inflationary shift, and we saw in the short run the increase in the price of the goods we sold, but we didn't see the increase in cost. And so there's a lag process. Well, what's happening now is that the public is much more aware of, of how this works, and to the point that in around 1980, the Fed started announcing that it would not only uh, issue uh, figures every week on money supply, but also forward moving averages and things like that. They're trying to get people to, re to react less uh, less strongly to the one-week shift in the money supply. I mean, people, people understand through the internet, through the media, and through education, they're much more aware. And so we're seeing the adjustments being made more quickly and the trade-offs don't last as long. So there are a lot of factors that are shifting those lags back and forth. So if we, uh, if we do the arithmetic here, uh, we wind up with a 7.2% with a uh, inflation rate, but there, it does not include the velocity changes, and it's not considering the overhang in, in bank reserves. Now, I said uh, we didn't include velocity. Let's look at what velocity is doing. Uh, it is falling. So in, in a sense, that's going to reduce the inflationary risk. Okay? Because it's, it's, if it's falling, then it's going to be a, a, a negative, which means it's going to subtract from the money supply growth rate. But one thing that leaps out is, why is it falling? Um, and, and the other one is MZM. Uh, the Fed has been on this search for monetary aggregates, as I said, and MZM is money with zero maturity. That's another attempt to get a better fix on the money supply. But in any case, they're both, these are the velocities for these two aggregates, and they are falling. And the implication is that money isn't changing hands as often. And we're not just talking about currency, any kind, of, any kind of money. So there's a slowing of transactions. And with advances in technology, you would expect that the payments would move more quickly, not, not more slowly. And this tells us something about the economy. So it's a, it's a source of some concern as it is. But as you can see, we're running at about one and a half. So you might be able to take off a little bit off of uh, the, the inflation forecast with the, with the quantity theory, if you, if you want to be careful, and it would be one at six or something, whatever, whatever that was, I think seven point, whatever I had, and subtract the one and a half, and you could drop it some. But this doesn't take into account this bigger concern about the, the bank reserves. So to ensure liquidity, in order to, to encourage this recovery, the Fed, it appears what they did was they and it makes sense, I mean, I'm not even arguing the point, but they were trying to keep into this transactions of media uh, growing at a, at a fairly steady rate from what it had been growing in order to keep uh, the, the financial system intact. Okay? They, were, they were in a financial crisis, and that seemed like the, the right uh, thing to do. And so the Fed doesn't control the money supply. Uh, this is a, this is a uh, uh, undergraduate mistake. Uh, some people think that the Fed controls the money supply, and in quick and dirty talk, people will say that, but no, they don't. They, they control bank reserves. They don't control the money supply. So this is a, this is a huge realization. I mean, I, I, uh, that the, there's a chain, and that the Fed is at one end of it, and it's trying to get that other end to move, and uh, it doesn't always go where they want. You know, I just just to emphasize that point. So they can affect banks, bank profitability, uh, and, and effectively encourage them to make loans, do other things, and expand the money supply. The Fed can, can uh, through open market operations and other means, give them more reserves from which they can make loans. But in the end, they don't control the money supply. Um, and so we're going to see the result of that, 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 that problem. Between October 2008 and December 2011, the Fed expanded the, the base. Now, the base is the monetary base. This is bank reserves plus currency. These are things that Fed can do something about, <laughs> the bank reserves and, and the currency in circulation. So they expanded the monetary base by roughly one and a half billion, one and a half trillion uh, to roughly 2.6 trillion. And by February this year, it had more than doubled. This is a massive expansion in the monetary base. And the monetary base is the, is the core of the, the monetary system. It gets expanded through bank lending into the money supply. So it's currency circulation, it's bank reserves. The bank reserves are sitting in banks. You and I aren't spending them, so we aren't using them to bid up prices. 
It's when that money gets out on the street that it starts to make a difference in prices. And the, 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 uh, the banks get it on the street by making loans. Right? That's, that's how you get it out of the bank. Yeah. Which was part of the balance sheet of um, the bank and this figure, which is a base. The base, um, That's what? also supposed to be It was like for cards over there. Yeah. Now, in, in 2011 alone, adjusted bank reserves increased at a compounded annual rate of 47.1%. An outrageously big number. Okay, so it's enough to make economists kind of roll their eyes and go, what? You know, uh, in the first half, reserves increased by 100, almost 188%. Just, just unheard of expansion in reserves. So this is enough to make you sort of ponder, you know, what this might mean. Banks are currently holding about, it's actually about 1. Well, 1.5 trillion in excess of their reserve requirements. Now, that's about 15 times more than they need to hold. Now, banks traditionally, uh, the way it worked is, is they take deposits, and out of their deposits, your bank deposits, they, they are obligated by the Fed, the reserve requirements, to keep about 10% of it. So they, they'll keep, if you put $100 in, they'll take $10, throw it in, into uh, their reserves, and then they'll take the $90 and they'll make loans. That's what they do. That's how they can pay you with your on your account, right? Um, and the way the banks do it is that that's the only way they make money. That's the primary way they make money is by making loans and collecting interest, right? Um, so you wouldn't want to be sitting around with a lot of extra reserves, you know, doing nothing, not making money for it. This is like a manufacturing firm deliberately keeping their, their goods in inventory and refusing to sell them. I mean, you, you just don't do that. You, so you want to you make loans as close down to the reserve requirements as possible, and so historically they were keeping 1% or 2% over reserves. Um, but that's, uh, the Fed's paying them interest, so it's not as though it's not really make, setting and not making money. And in, in the essence, they're probably making more money, or they think they're making more money um, keeping it uh, with the, in the reserves than making risky loans to... We'll get to that. That's people. exactly right. This is a, this is a big innovation. A big change for the for the Fed to start paying them interest on the reserves, and certainly, it's a great deal for them since they don't have to take any risk, as you as you indicated there at the end. I mean, uh, so they, they, they would probably percent. make more money, but they, for that they have to take risks and make those risky loans, right? right. And, and they, 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 with they, a quarter percent, it's free and easy, and the Fed seems willing to give them more and more reserves to make interest on. So, you know, yeah, what, yeah. what a deal! But there it sits in in reserves. So here, here is a, the most recent graph of this. This, this line down here, the, the one right near the bottom, that's the required reserves. And as you look at their adjusted reserves, I mean, they're, they're right on top. They're just 1 or 2% on top of that. They, they just don't hold much because holding back loans means not making a profit. But here is what we were just describing. It just, it just exploded. They, they piled it in there. And this is this is money that this these are these are dollars that can wind up as part of M2. Potentially. I'm not, I'm not saying every dollar will, heaven forbid. But it potentially could go there. Now this shows uh, the monetary base, how it expands in the M2 through the multiplier process, through banks making loans. And I did this on a log scale. And so you can see that, that these two are pretty parallel. There's a sort of a closing in here around 96, 97, and then it's sort of even again, the distance between the two. And it reflects, since this is a power of 10, and you can see that's just a little bit smaller than that, uh, that reflects there's a fairly constant multiplier between the base and M2 uh, for over, over 10 years before the, the, the crisis. Uh, and it turns out that it was uh, between eight and nine uh, times that you, you would get the base multiplied into the money supply. What this really shows, I, what I, the reason I did this, is you can see that, that that relationship collapses as the multiplier collapses. And and I I, I think it's, it's pretty clear, and I, I talked to people at the Fed that I know about this, and they, they, they claim they, they believe that's what, what they're doing as well, is trying to keep M2 going along the same path, more or less. You know? And so they just, 
pushed whatever they had to into reserve to keep that happening. That was to keep the system going, keep it liquid, um, which sort, sort of makes sense, except that on the back end of it, and, they, and the Fed knows they have a problem. On the back end of it, how do I get the reserves back out of the system? How do I prevent the inflation? So this is not to attack the Fed. This is sort of just to understand what they're doing and, and understand the challenges and try to assess the risks. So that, that's kind of where we're, we're, we're going here. So this, this collapse, this actually collapse here, is the collapse of the multiplier. And, and it was done, but, but to keep that into moving, which sort of makes sense. Yeah. We, you know, this probably wouldn't be one for one, but couldn't the sale of assets then offset the inflationary impact of, or the, the money supply impact of, um, of the monetary base growing as reserves become loans? The sale of assets? Like all the things, like you mentioned, like the bond, like all the bonds that the Fed has been buying and MBSs and other things that, that well, the Fed will eventually that. sell to reduce well, the balance sheet. I'm pretty sure that's played in the British. I mean, the, the, there are methods that Fed can use, you know, if, if, if and when inflation starts popping up, the Fed will, can, I'm pretty sure they can try to do something to restrain it. And there are several options of which selling bonds off the balance sheet is one of those options. Right. But there are some questions about yeah. how successful they will be, which I'm assuming is going to come later on. How quickly, uh, what it's going to do to interest rates and all the rest. Yeah. Because especially since they moved into long-term uh, bonds, yeah. uh, you did have some class about how bond prices move, right? So if interest rates jump even not too much, price of a long-term bond falls off the plate, much more so than for a short-term bond. So mm -hmm. how many losses can a Fed take? Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, the other, I've sat in on um, like Bill Dudley when he speaks in New York, and, and he always was saying that in terms of dealing with inflation, that that whole, that new tool of paying interest on those reserves, he felt that that would be a really effective lever to, to push it, when. I think it'll fit prominently in their, their plan. Yeah. Uh, of yeah. course, when they raise. You just increase that rate as soon as you start seeing there's a, I mean, there's a funny thing happening there, though. I, I just, well, first of all, I have to tell you, I, 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 this is the first sense of humor about these things, and it just amazes me to think that somebody might contact and say, here, I'm going to give you this pile of money, and oh, here, I'll pay you interest on it. You like some more money? Here's some more. Oh, yeah, I'll pay you interest on that, too. And I wouldn't want you to spend it, so let me give you a higher interest rate on the money I just gave you. It just it just messes with me to think that that, that happens. Uh, but it does reflect the other side of it, is the Fed is paying interest on those, and how do they pay interest? They print money to do it. So you, you've got this expansion going on as they, they keep trying to chase this by raising the interest rate to prevent people from using the money that they've given them. Which also points to another issue that I think is critical in this, is that I don't think that the Fed nor the banks is thinking of, of reserves the same way they used to. You know. It, it was before this notion that that's how we make loans, and you, you loan down to your, your required reserves, and that's the end of it. But now it's it's like those reserves are balanced to the balance sheets of banks, and it's a source of, of, of income from the Fed, and it's a way of manipulating bank profitability and doing other things. It has a, it's taken a whole different tone, uh, and trying to sort that out for me, I mean, given that I, I'm used to seeing it done another way, is it, a little bit challenging. Uh, but yeah, I absolutely agree. I, I, mean, I think would, that at least the way it was portrayed in, in some of these speeches that I decided on was that, it, that of course they weren't 100 percent confident that increasing that interest rate would, would necessarily affect or reduce inflation, but they did feel it was an important I, I agree. new tool in the toolbox. I, yeah. agree. I, I, I agree. got that sense right at the time when they introduced the uh, yeah. interest on reserves, which was way in the beginning of yeah. 2008. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that they fully realized at the time the reserves will be $1.5 trillion. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, there's 100 billion sitting there. Uh, yeah. I thought it was 100 billion. So let's say we double it, or, or no, no, right, one to 500 billion, you know, yeah. half a trillion. So you add half a percentage point to interest rate, so you expand reserves by paying a minister, but it's not that much. It's, it's $1.5 trillion. Yeah. You pay the 1% of that, right. that's right. a monetary right. amount of money all of a sudden. But I, I believe that it will be a, it'll be a major tool of what they do. 
uh, there's been talk about raising reserve requirements. We'll talk about some of this in a bit. But uh, obviously, you could just say the reserves you have, you have to hold now. <laughs> you can do that. Uh, but the problem is, is that not all banks are equal. Some banks, smaller banks, uh, they, they, they're not carrying those excess reserves. And if they're suddenly hit with the same reserve requirement as everybody else, uh, it's going to put them out of business. They're going to be in bad shape, whereas the larger banks wouldn't have a problem. So I suppose you could create it and you try some sort of differential approach. You know, I, I, I don't know. But it, it, we're chasing. That's the whole point. And, and, and maybe we'll work out a deal that'll, that'll make it help, help us avoid the inflation. But how quickly can they do this? How quickly can they make it work? And, and, and as, I, as I mentioned later, is that the Fed has actually been doing what, what one, one uh, uh, economist called drills. They, they're actually trying out things and trying to see what leverage they get out of each thing. They'll tweak it and they'll turn it and they'll try to see how much do we get from that, how much do we get. They're trying to find the mix of tools to bring this down. And the, the energy they're putting into it reflects that they have a big concern about whether they can do it, how quickly they can do it, how much they can avoid the inflation. Because of the lags involved as well, one of my concerns, um, and I mentioned it earlier, was the lag issue, is that, you know, do you want to wait until inflation is already popping to start trying to pull this thing back? I mean, if I had to pick my preference, and, and you know, I don't run the world, I mean, I would be trying to bring this back now. I'd be trying to get this under control now and not wait until the inflation's already there, because then you're looking for a lag to have whatever you do reduce the inflation in the future. You're always working with a lag, you know? But this is what we have. So the money multiplier for about a decade before fall 2008 was in the 8 9% range. And uh, that means eight, every new dollar base resulted in 8 or $9 in the money supply. And after the, uh, the crisis, uh, it dropped to about 3 and a half to 4 So that's an enormous drop in, in the multiplier. This is the actual multiplier for M2. And here's this period I was just describing. Uh, this is that long flat period from 95 on. You can use the button, but then I'll shake. Uh, anyway, uh, you can see though, it, it, it collapses out here. And then you've got the, the QE programs as they make attempts to, to shore this back up. And the, the multiplier uh, drops to 3.45 at the end of this. So massive collapse in the, in the multiplier. Um, there's the reasons why the multiplier would collapse. Uh, of course, the, ra the rapid expansion in reserve at the same time the bank is, banking industry was criticized for making risky loans before the, the meltdown, uh, which produced the weak balance sheets. But then, of course, you know, that would make them reluctant to lend. But now you're in the, ma in the center of a massive recession, which is uh, uh, unusually severe by, by any standards and uh, finding low risk uh, borrowers to, to lend to is a problem. Um, it's, and especially after being criticized for making risky loans, you're not going to go out and seek out those people to make the loans to. So that uh, the lending just sort of dried up. And as you pointed out, uh, in October 2008, the Fed started paying interest on reserves and the reserve banks. This was a big, big step. Um, but it has made it profitable for banks to forego lending in favor of this low risk profit. Uh, all they have to do is live and breathe and they collect this money from, from the Fed. And as you said, that changing the interest rate on those reserves would be a way to uh, discourage banks from, from, uh, from lending, which is, which is sort of bizarre in a way because the banks now are getting criticized for not making loans. <laughs> so, uh, well, they, they do, and whenever you ask them about it, they all they, the reason they never say, oh, because we're actually you know making yeah. money off the Fed. There's they, the reason is always, oh, because there's nobody to lend to. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. no demand. Um, what, what they mean is that, that it's more profitable at a low exactly. risk, right? You or, know? or that the regulators are breathing down our necks, and that's why we, we can't go and lend it to the uh, risky. Well, and, and if, the, if the Fed raises the interest rate, they'll be less likely to lend. But when they do, it'll be at a higher interest rate, uh, you know, and, and then that's going to slow the economy and, and could have an effect on the recovery. So, so now you're struggling on that end. You know, uh, you might be able to stop the expansion of the, the money supply 
But by raising those interest rates, you're, you're going to slow the recovery, and nobody wants that either. So they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. Uh, I was wondering how that is um, servicing on interest and interest, uh, um, interest rate. Um, is this part of the reason why the Fed is expanding their balance sheet? Obviously, interest, what they have on the asset side, so well, they have to pay this. The, the, the Fed, of course, other than Fed wire. Yeah, the the the, the, uh, the banks all have accounts with the Federal Reserve, and then all the Fed has to do is increase the balance on the computer. Yeah, it's a pretty straightforward process, so it's all it's all funny money. Yeah. How, how much flexibility does the Fed have to, to change, and how quickly can it change reserve requirements? Is, is it one of the arguments that going yeah, exactly. forward they could they could make reserve requirements counter cyclical, so encourage banks to hold more required reserves, you know, during um, contractually times, the right way around? Yeah, I, so I, I understand what you're saying, yeah. Uh, the, the Fed, they can change it as often as they want. The question would they? Um, I, uh, when I was at the Fed, there was a, there was a, a problem that, not this, this large by any means, but uh, it, was, it was trying to contract the money supply, and I actually had sort of a, I'll ask anything. I figure, you know, we throw these things out and you learn and all that. So I, I, I mentioned uh, reserve requirements and uh, the, the senior guy at the meeting, it was the vice chairman at the time, he, he laughed. He said, well, you know, uh, conducting monetary policy with reserve requirements is like, like hammering thumbtacks with a sledgehammer. You know, it's, it's, it's just so brutal to the economy. But you don't want to swing those around very often. It, it's, it's not very easy to deal with. Now, that said, with, with the, the large reserves that you have and, and this sense of maintaining higher levels of reserves beyond required reserves and paying interest, you, it, it may be easier to do now because you're not as likely to, uh, to, to put a bank in a situation and have to call loans and things like that. You know, they, they, they've got the reserves, now they're just, they're just making adjustments. So I, I, that, that's a fair question, but there is, I think, still a spirit that it is a it is a, a brutal sort of a policy and you would want to make people aware how it's going to operate and that it is going to fluctuate and give them ranges and they're going to have to have some sort of operating procedure so the banks know what to do with that. They can't commit to loans and then have the cyclical reserve requirement shift and now they've got, what do they do? They call it back, you know, I mean, they, 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 they've got to have, they're going to have to keep a pad in order to be able to allow for the fluctuations which is going to, which is going to hold up some of the reserves as well. It's 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 complicated. What's under discussion for Basel three, right? It's, it's all these kind of things. Did you want to jump in before? Yeah, the the thing was, I mean, it's, it's sort of a common knowledge as in the textbooks that you know the reserve requirements are like this, this massive tool, so you, you don't want to use it unless you need a massive effect. But there is still, a, it's not entirely certain what the effect would be in the sense like. Why, we really need to know an answer to the question, why do banks keep so much of the access to it? Just because they want, you know, they have nothing to do with the money that's lying around? Or is it because I actually do want to, as a bank, I want to have this much over the required reserve? Like say, what if, what if my rule of operation in the bank, I figured, given how risky things are, and given how risky my assets are, and that some loans might go bad or whatever, I want to have you know, 50% more money than the required in reserves. You increase reserve requirements, <laughs> I increase the how much I hold anyway. So it might actually contract uh, That's true. much further. And uh, so it's important for, for Fed to know how banks are gonna re re react to when you raise the reserve requirements. Maybe well, this will be a way bigger contraction than before. One of the things I want to mention is we were talking about all these, these different ideas, these new things, great, great stuff. But just keep in mind, we're talking about new ideas about how to do All this is new. We're in new territory. And so trying to measure how effective that can be and, and how well that the Fed's going to be able to, to pull this off, it just has a sense of risk because we've not done this before. We've not, we've not been through this. It may work out. We may be smart enough, but it's, it's kind of scary. Because, because the Fed needs actual numbers, not just if we do this, banks are going to pull back. Uh, how like much? And that's where the experiments are coming into play. Perfect more or less precise number, you know, plus or minus a trail line isn't going to cut <laughs> a little bit, you know, maybe kind of build. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I just don't understand, though, what is the current rationale for paying above zero on those reserves right now? 
of a zero interest rate. I mean, if, if, if the concern is that banks are just holding on to these reserves, I mean, why are they even paying 0.25%? That's sort of my point about giving me money and then paying me to, to, to hang on to it. I mean, uh, why don't they get a double-edged sword? Because if they don't pay, the banks may go and uh, and use it and loan it, and then that would be very inflationary. And the Fed really is afraid. I know, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a, now. so they create they've got themselves into a point where they can't either they can't they can't lower it they can't, they can't. Yeah, they, they're forced to pay it. If they don't pay it, then they'll face the other evil. But even just reduce it. I mean, well, I think, I think initially too they were trying to shore up the bank's balance yeah. because the, well, yeah. the, the banks in the system were having problems in some right. way. By letting them hold reserves and get paid for them, they gave them another source of income and, and helped to help to allow them to not have to take the risk that they might have taken. So it, right. I but, have another theory that because they, but when, I mean, is the they view right them. now that banks are not? I mean, what's the Fed view right now? I mean, that that we are in a good lending state, that we are lending enough money. No. If the view no. is, you know, we're not lending money. Right, exactly. No. So if the view is that we're not lending money, why don't they just reduce that rate? Well, I mean, if they see this as a powerful lever, they're not using it. Right well, now. here's the theory. I don't know if it's true or not. It's just sense. a guess. But when they first introduced the interest on reserves, it was 0.25. Uh -huh. I think they don't really know for sure how it's going to affect, what the effect will be. Like if you go from 0.25 to 0.15, what is it going to do? So they just, maybe they're not going to touch it until they have to. You know, they introduced it to have the, the tool. Now, whether or not you can regulate lending with the tool is unknown. It's never right. been tried before, not just by the Fed, but by anyone. Yeah. You know, that's the central bank that pays the interest from two point, like, So maybe they just don't want to touch it. I don't know if it's that. No, they're going to have to. Public opinion, the banks are not strong at all. It's a, you know, it's a legal way of competing other than putting yeah, they don't want to. They don't want to receive, you know, like another tarp anymore, so that everyone can control. At the same time, they want free money. It's exactly what Jeff said. So for banks, it's win-win. Yeah, yeah. Well, the banks. But for the Fed and the rest of us, it's kind of. Well, that's right. The banks. Uh, the banks <laughs> complained for years about not getting any, any interest on those reserves. So it was a nice gift. It also it has a sense that you also touched on is it affects public sentiment that there was this fear. This is one of the biggest problems in a financial crisis, the public becomes afraid. I, I, I see this in a very emphasized way that every time there's any burp in the economy, my mother calls me, a little bit less in recent years because she's got Alzheimer's, but, but she, she would call me and, and she wanted to know if it's time to go maybe bury some money in the backyard. I mean, she was serious. She lived in the Great Depression, you know, so <laughs> she's seen a financial crisis before. It's just when I put the money in the jar and bury it in the backyard. And, and, and so when that happens, though, of course, the multiplier collapses even more because money's not going into banks. You know. so, so the Fed steps up and it throws the money in the banks. It pays the, the interest rate. It makes a big show of the whole thing, you know, and says, yeah, look at that. They're piling up reserves. We're taking care of them. No, not to worry. Your bank is on. So it affects that, that sort of sensibility in the public. They kind of... Yeah, because it's a little too much away because, the, you know, the, the scum loans, from what I can tell, are not being done. I mean, it's still there, the, the option is there, have. but there is a lot of the stigma, especially you nowadays, you know, if, you, if, you, if the banks were going to go borrow from the Fed. So the Fed is, in some ways, doing that. The flip side is, it's going to give money to all the banks, so you can't tell yeah. which one is okay and which one is not. <laughs> yeah. I am really ticked off. <laughs> so, I am, I, you know, if I, if I had a balance on my credit card, I'd be paying 18, 19%. Meanwhile, my savings, my best savings account is 0.4%. Yeah. So my 19-year-old son is smart enough to tell me, you should be spending the money, don't be saving it. And so I'm going out and spending all my money. I'm not saving anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate, we appreciate your help with the economy. You know, we, we, we've been waiting for you to get started so things are turn around. Yeah. <laughs> That was the intent of the fact of the zero interest rate, to make you not save and go spend. So that was it, right? So, okay. so, I mean, it's, that's exactly what's happening with the banks. They're borrowing, and they, not only they're borrowing from the Fed at low interest rates, they're getting paid for their reserves, okay. and then they're going off and then charging people like us 18%. I agree. So that's, uh, that's, and they are in a win-win situation. Yeah. Are the banks borrowing in 0%? What is the, 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 the cost for the banks to discount. borrow from the Fed? Oh, the, the discount rate is not zero. I think it's a quarter. Yeah, but we have a few quarters. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
the banks do not borrow from the Fed? They, they borrow through the Fed funds rate, right? like short term funds rate. They do so kind of between each other. They buy and sell between each other. 25 basis. Yeah. So the multiplier, though, the multiplier will be likely to recover as the as the recovery continues and bank lending expands. And it turns out that the pace of bank lending is on the rise. Um, for the purposes of this analysis, I'm going I'm to assume that the, that the uh, multiplier gets back up to the bottom end of its range. But you can see these are total loans and leases, commercial and industrial loans, and uh, these are percent changes from a year ago. You can see they're both in positive territory. They're expanding. They were contracting before, but now we're seeing the lending pick up, which means those multipliers should start to move. Okay, so that, that's what puts the money out of reserves and into the street. They make loans and they give it to people, so it comes out of those reserves. And so we are seeing, you know, reserves starting to drop a little bit, which is kind of nice, but the bad news is, is it's going into the money supply and it's going through through lending. So there is that real concern that as this continues, and it should, I mean, if the economy recovers, that's what it's supposed to do. And the lending should increase and we should see uh, um, an expansion of the money supply. So we've already talked about a lot of this, so I don't need to go into this too much, but uh, the, uh, the Fed has talked extensively about this problem. This is not, this is this was not to say, oh, look, look, you didn't know this, and the Fed has been keeping this secret. Okay, everybody's been talking about it. We were just trying to get a number on it, and part of what we try to do that I think, you know, you can engage in here is that is we are trying to lay out a simple framework, show how the pieces connect, give a little bit of an education to our readers at the same time as we, we start to try to put some numbers and directions on things, you know, so that's kind of what we do. But uh, the, the Fed uh, has engaged in some exercises where they've, they've tried to do some experiments with banks to try to find out what those responses are because so much of this, so many of the tools they are going to use, they don't know how much leverage they have. They don't, they don't know what the responses are going to be. And, and they could get into just as much trouble by over driving the system is underdriving it. I mean, they, they, they've got to be careful. So I would expect, and I think they will do this, they'll, they'll be making incremental changes initially and trying to see what the responses feel like and then they'll extend. I doubt that they'll they'll pop the reserve requirements overnight. I mean, they're, they're, they're going to wait and see how the other things feel and then they'll make adjustments. So they can, they can increase in interest rates on, on reserves. They can, um, they can increase reserve requirements. They're also working on a long-term repo thing. I say long-term. Repos are usually overnight. Repurchase agreements, they buy, they, 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 come, they contract to, 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 to reverse the, the transaction overnight or something, but now they're looking at longer periods and using that to try to iron out uh, some of the, uh, the fluctuations. So they're trying all sorts of things to find some way to bring this down. And there's certainly every reason to believe they will be at least partially successful. I hope that they're fully successful. I don't want to have a high inflation rate, uh, you know, beating up my paycheck, you know. So I, I you know, we hope that they make it. But, but we're, we're seeing they're in new territory on so many different levels that we just don't know how successful they can be. I'll also point out that one of the things that's going to stand in their way is this shows the, the distribution of the Treasury securities held in the Fed's portfolio. Uh, over time, I and mean, you can see that back 2007, uh, most of their their holdings were maturities one year or less, and very few of them were, were long bonds. And then they've made the shift through time into these longer term securities. And part of it is the the twist and other mechanisms, but they they are loaded up on longer term maturities, which are going to be more problematic as interest rates start to pop, and they want to conduct open market operations to try to trade off reserves and this is going to be an obstacle. None of this is insurmountable, but this is where they're used to living and this is where they are now. It's a new world and we know that there are problems with booting out those, those bonds. If you look at the composition of their assets, you can see that again this is where they were and this even if you don't read the detail you can see that it's a whole different uh, structure. Yeah. Going back two slides, uh, you talked about repos. I'm trying, there we go. Uh, <laughs> So if the Fed used a repo agreement where they sold assets temporarily to banks and that allowed them to drain reserves from the banking system, at, at some point that transaction it switches. Reverses. So how do they, I mean, how do they, how do they structure the, like the, 
the timing of that? I mean, because you, you presumably want that to reverse after economic activity has picked up enough that like the money supply can expand again, right? They could also roll them. I'll just roll it over. They'll just keep okay. rolling, and I think that's what they're doing. Then they'll pick their moment, and then they'll reverse, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, practically, I think when you do a repo, you set the date and the price at which you will reverse it. It's not like we will later and choose. No, no, it's like this is for 30 days. Yeah, Selling this now to you, 30 days later, I buy it from you at this price. It's all reset. At, at but they'll the roll them. And that's how they'll, they'll, they'll then they can, they, can, they can have some flexibility in timing. Uh, reserves always then go back up. And, uh, they will ultimately, yeah, unless they use yeah. that to bridge into other mechanisms, which is what I think will happen. Yeah, so I think green was mostly used to sort of, to smooth out fluctuations over the next several weeks kind of thing. It's not, you don't do something for last a year. Repo is like, if we do it here, I don't know, increasing the reserve interest rates or something, then we want to go ahead and This would be like a yeah. minor ingredient. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, it yeah. helped them to bridge into other, okay. one mechanism to another. They, they're also facing the problem that we're running massive deficits, as you know, and uh, Treasury has to push out the bonds, and the Fed manages that process to, to ensure that the interest rates don't, don't get out of control in the process, right? Um, the Fed technically buy. doesn't buy the new bonds, but they can clear out the, the market to provide the opening for the old, for, for the new bonds. They can buy old bonds, yeah. leave enough space for the new bonds. They, so they're just adjusting the, 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 uh, the uh, current market uh, in order to maintain the interest rates. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I've seen this at the Fed when certain things hit the market and they'll sit and watch on the electronic unit and as, as the interest rates start to pop up a few basis points, the, the, the trading desk comes in and you just see them tick right back down. They'll just fight it up and down until they, they keep that interest rate where they want it. It's, it's an amazing process to watch them do this. Um, so, in any case, uh, the Fed is typically buying enough bonds to offset about 60% of the new treasury paper hitting the, hitting the market each, each auction. Uh, so they're clearly monetizing with that. I mean, it's, it's sort of hidden. I don't think they're trying to hide it. Can you repeat that bigger again? 60%. Yeah, so, so, so clearly they, they, are, they are trying to ease the, the uh, the, the, the sale of the treasury debt to the public. But I mean, they have every reason to want to do this because they're trying to keep interest rates down to keep the recovery on track. It's not malicious, but they're in, again, they're in the, between a rock and a hard place. If they are buying 60% of that debt effectively, they are expanding the money supply, you know, every auction in order to do it. And, and so then they're trying to work off the reserves and keep the banks from from, uh, from moving the reserves onto the street, at the same time they're adding to the reserves <laughs> in huge amounts, you know, because they're trying to deal with the with the deficit problem. Now, the, the point of the, from the point of the view of the Fed, I mean, again, they're, they're at every angle, every direction they turn <laughs> between the public, the banking system, the treasury, they're between this rock and our place. You know, well, what do I do? Do I let the interest rates go? Uh, that's going to be problematic. Uh, if I let the reserves go to the street, that's going to cause inflation. They've painted themselves into a very awkward corner, and they're struggling for tools to try to deal with the problem. And I, I'm hugely sympathetic. If you look at each one of these steps, you go, well, yeah, of course you're not going to let the financial system collapse. Of course you're not going to. I mean, you know, you can see how they got there, but oh my gosh, you know. And part of it is that we get put so much on the bed, you know. <laughs> It's like Congress says, we'll just spend whatever we want, and, and you'll have to deal with it. You know, I mean, it's quite that bad. But it, it's, it's, it's so much is being pushed onto the Fed, and they're, they're slowly getting pushed into a corner where they, they, they aren't going to be able to deal with it so, so well. Uh, the, the, the Fed's claims notwithstanding, it, it seems unlikely that, that they'll be able to do this perfectly. So in order to get us the number, and, and, and I certainly encourage you that if you think the number is different, then make the adjustment that you'll be able to use the table on the next slide to, to formalize your projection. Um, we, uh, we decided that uh, we would assume that the Fed will reduce its reserves by 25%, um, and 
won't raise the reserve requirements. It, with that kind of estimate, um, and we, we assume that the multiplier will increase to back to the lower end of its range as the lending increases and it is taking off. That would yield about $3.9 trillion of new M2 dollars. And that's an increase of roughly 40% or almost five and a half times the growth rate of M2 in 2011. And uh, to figure out the impact of that kind of a growth rate of the money supply, we did a cross section uh, of the money inflation experiences around the world. We've been 103 countries over 10 years. I want to emphasize what we did is we looked at the 10-year growth rate of the money supply annualized and the 10-year and the average inflation rate. So we were subsuming all the lag structure. And that's key because the lag structure could be critical in all this. But I'm just telling you straight that's how we did it. Uh, so based on that relationship, 40% increase in M2 would result in an inflation rate of about 15%. I, I hope that's wrong, but that's, that's the way the arithmetic works. Now, if, if you want to make a different assessment of how much you think the Fed will be able to drain, maybe they're able to lock away 50% or whatever, you can just do the arithmetic and you go to the table, to the chart, I mean, we can back up and figure out what the inflation rate would be. But it looks like there will be inflation, <laughs> you know, uh, depending on, on, on how uh, much you think the multiplier will move and, and how much you think the Fed can bottle up, keep from going into the economy, you know, you can come up with your own money supply growth rate number and come up with your own forecast. But this, see this again, as I mentioned, this is sort of what we do. We give people a framework yeah, you go in here and you make your own adjustment. But now you know the connections. You know the linkages. You know what the risks are. You know how all this works. You can come up with your own number. You can pick your own, your own inflation forecast. But it certainly looks like you're going to be looking at money supply growth up here somewhere, which are going to translate into an inflation rate substantially higher than we have now. And that's CPI. So what's EPI then? Well, uh, I don't know. But this is what this is the data we have from 103 countries we could get into. But Given you know that it's it is higher and more volatile, you would expect to get even bigger numbers, Because right? this why, is being weighted down. By why do you German. assume that the bank reserves are not the bank reserve requirements are not being increased? Well, they, you know, obviously you could just assume that, that, that the banks that the Fed just says if you're holding 15 times reserve, you now have to hold them. You can't you can't move it at all. You can increase the reserve requirements all they want. I would not. I would not believe that, first of all, I don't think the Fed would do it right away. I think that uh, it is too big of a club to hit the market with. I think that uh, they would ease into it if they did anything. As I said, there is a differential effect on large and small banks in terms of how much reserves they're holding. So they have to be very sensitive to that. And so I, I just don't think they're going to step up and try to, to shut that down by reserve requirements. I think you might see incremental changes. And, and they'll combine it with these other things we talked about. We'll raise the interest rate on, on reserves and other things. But most of these things would have the impact of raising interest rates, which is going to, first of all, um, it, it's, it's going to um, slow the economy. I mean, it, it, it's, this is counter to wanting to expand the, the, the economy and to fight the, the recession and lower unemployment. This goes back to the Fed's dual mandate. I mean, that kind of trapped in that too, that uh, in order to reduce unemployment, expand output, they have to be willing to accept more inflation in the short run if they're going to try to do it through monetary policy. Uh, monetary policy is, uh, is, is going to be, uh, have a short run effect anyways. So I just don't think they're going to pull over. I guess, but I'm wondering, this forecast, is this forecast for the Fed's rate increase going to be the same as the forecast for next year? I mean, what's the forecast for as I said, with the lags, the normal lags probably looking a year and a half out, uh -huh. and and that's that's kind of important because it suggests that if you if you if you see this as a as an issue, not this specific number, but I mean this, this whole sort of process, then with that lag structure, you, you would be wanting to do something right now. You'd be wanting to start to unwind this as quickly as you can now, um, because you want you want to start ramping down so you can do this over time, you don't want to be implementing all of the, the sort of radical measures that you would have to incorporate to, to lock up that money overnight. What a huge convulsion to the financial system that's already somewhat fragile. 
and you've got the lag. You know, so, so you, don't, you, you, you can wait until the inflation is 10% and then do it, but then you've got the convulsions in the market, you've got the high inflation, and you've got the lag you've got to live through. So, so you, you want to start dealing with it. You know, and I think the Fed's talking. They're, they're trying out a few things, but they haven't really started to put anything into operation yet. I think partly because there, there is this continuing concern that, that the economy is going to slow. And um, if you look at all of the, the, uh, the, the fiscal policy issues coming to bear at the end of this year, and everybody wants to wait until after the, the, the election to deal with anything, but um, the estimates are that all of those things collectively, and, and, and again, it's like a worst case scenario because not all of them are going to, you know, continue. I mean, the, 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 the Bush tax cuts die, and uh, we have additional costs from the uh, National Health Care Program. I mean, there's all these things. Certainly some of them will be dealt with, but if you take all of them together, they can apply as much as a three and a half to four per percentage point hit to GDP, real GDP, which would put us into a recession. So if you're looking at that, that scenario and you don't trust Congress to deal with it, uh, you, you don't want to be trying to, to raise interest rates and slow the economy with that coming down the pipe. Uh, if they had more confidence that that was going to be dealt with, and it could be, you know, you deal with that more, then, then you might want to say, well, good, we, we, can, we can afford to start on this now. But again, the, 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 the Fed's just trapped. You know? I know you want to get in here. Now, I, I want to ask in the previous slide where you said banks don't use reserves like they used to. Yeah. Are you talking about like they're going to hold, their, you assume, holding higher levels of excess reserves? Or That's what I think. Yeah. They're going to hire higher reserves, higher excess reserves. And this was going back to that sort of notion that I mentioned that, that before they looked at those reserves as inventory. <laughs> that's, that's my inventory of goods that I can sell, you know. And you don't want to leave it on the shelf. You want to, yeah. you want to sell it. And, and they would, so they would try to lend down as much as they could to the, to the reserve requirements. And they'll sell everything that's on the shelf, you know. Now, in practice, they're not quite that crazy. I mean, they, they said, well, let's keep one or two percent. You know, you don't want, you, you can't manage your loan officers that well. You don't want to get trapped. You could be at the Fed funds market every day trying to get reserves, you know. But, but they, they, they were trying to, to, to basically lend out all the money. Now, though, it's a whole different feel. That's balance to the balance sheet. That is, uh, that's, that's a, that is money that, that makes us look more stable. Uh, we're going to get a return on it. We're going to, I mean, they, they're treating it a different way. So why do you assume an increase in the multiplier back to eight? Why, why not lower? Well, I picked the low end of the range, and uh, that the the, uh, the the lending um, this would be uh, this would I thought eight, we were at eight to nine, so I. It was a little bit arbitrary. I mean, I'll be honest. I mean, we tried to look at, well, if they got back anywhere near to a normal range, that was it. So I'll just take the bottom of the range. It's, it's, it's been between 8 and 10, more recently, 8 to 9 or so. So just pick the low end of the range, and there'll be a number. So you can pick 7, and you can do the arithmetic. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what this process gives you, is that is the so If you pick a lower multiplier, you should have a lower risk. You know, your 15% number would be lower. You're, yeah, you're, what happens is you're, you're, yeah, you're going to have less money. Uh, you won't have 40%, you might have 30, you know. And uh, whatever it was, you know, something. And you'll be down here, so you might be down in here somewhere, and then you'll be up here and have 10%. Mm -hmm. you know? But that, that, that's what we were trying to do is build that process and give some sort of reasonable numbers and, and give people a chance to, to get in the game and try to figure out what they think is going to happen, but we're, we're showing, we're trying to show that, that that linkage and there's these issues that have to be done. Yeah. More question on the thumbs and remain. Um, why do you think when the you know, banks start to realize they have um, cash and have to lend it to the market, why, instead, why would you think that they would rather like, retire their debt and use it like, more you know, inflation like, for this kind of thing? Banks using yeah, they're using to retire that and just shrink their balance sheet rather than just because shrinking your balance sheet costs yeah. you profit. Yeah, you're the bank. You want right. I mean, banks don't have their own debt. Yeah, but if they have other people's money. Yeah. I mean, the, the reserves aren't 
isn't just their equity that they have. It is. It, it, is, it is money that, I mean, it could be in the form of, uh, of cash and liabilities that they have also, so they can't, they have to be, you know, they be substituted. It's, yeah, it's pretty so It's not like yeah. just cash that's sitting there with no liability associated with it. Right, right. So it's, not like it's, it's like your it's not an asset side, right? Well, what happens is you get a cash from depositors, right, right. you put it in your wall, those are your reserves, but you owe it back to the depositors. That's right, right. That's, That's your liability. Right. Right. One of the things that nobody's mentioned, you know, that, that you know, the economist, this sort of thing leaps out of me is that who says this is right? Now, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to cast, you know, doubt on my own analysis, but I mean, this is based on the historical data about how banks operate in the past around the world. And what we're, we're talking about here throughout the discussion is the banks aren't operating the same way anymore. <laughs> so so this, this may not be quite right either. But, and, but that only highlights the whole issue of the banks operating in a whole new area that they don't even know what they're doing. They, they, they have no experience. Do these relationships hold them? We think probably Loosely they do. I mean, there may be some adjustment, but there is going to be a relationship here and it's going to be something like this. But it, it is a problem. Yeah. There's one thing I want to point out about this chart is, uh, you know, the, the dots are much more clustered uh, to closer to gears at the low end right, and right. then are much more dispersed at the high end, point right. being, once we get into the area where money supply grows 40%, we don't know all that well the much experience going on here. It doesn't happen that often, so point and that that is added complexity. So fifteen without fifteen percent forecast has this error bound around it over there, somewhere between you know ten and twenty five, right? <laughs> something like that. But all oh, ten and twenty. How do you determine the slope? We actually fit a regression line to the to the data in, in this, um, so it, it's not actually. Uh, I didn't want to bore you with it, but yeah, yeah. We, we went through the, the linear regression to fit the line and so on. Yeah, okay, well, that, that's how we did it. But uh, uh, the, the, one of the I'm trying to emphasize is that the, the, the object of this wasn't to come up with a specific uh, inflation forecast and, uh, and say that's the answer. It was more to build process and get a sense of the trajectory of the way things were going. You know? And then that's what we, I think we've done. Can I ask you a question about the banks? Um, so the you you mentioned that the uh, so the, the large banks, um, you know, the top ones uh, have this really really high excess reserve uh, amounts. And so is there a relation? The smaller you are, the, the less money you have out there, or how, how does that work? I mean, is there? I mean, are there banks who are still having only ten percent reserves and yeah, there are, operating? There are banks that are operating much closer. Uh, local banks that they don't have quite the uh, they didn't take the risk they they are close to their community they yeah. done a lot of things and and so they in, in, not, in effect yeah. you'd be penalized them for doing a good job yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> they were doing the right things they didn't take the risky loans they they weren't crazy and, and they know who the neighborhoods they're loaning to and they, they did all those things they may even hold more of the mortgages in their own portfolio rather than selling them through you know pass through I mean you have a lot of different dynamics there and then you come back and say okay by the way you know this is a great job we're gonna Double your reserve requirements. Yeah, thanks. That would be a great way to get all the small banks bought out by the big ones. You know, I think we'd be pretty much uh, comfortable with that. I think we have lunch coming up soon. We have lunch here downstairs. Are the slides in the, the spreadsheet, are those on your website? Or can we get those? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. The actual, the whole store. It's not available. This store, this store is not available. No, you cannot. This is men only. Oh.